People expend a lot of time in our culture trying to change. A lot of time, a lot of money. Sometimes that change is merely physical, external change. But many times, their attempts are to really change their characters, to change who they are, to change their behavior at some basic foundational level. Typically, in secular culture today, when people try to pursue that kind of change, they do so primarily through several different mediums. For example, through self-help materials. Go into the local bookstore and there'll be shelf after shelf of self-help materials to, to help the person overcome these problems in their lives. Another avenue that people take is prescription drugs. They try to overcome the issues in their lives through the use of, of some sort of psychiatric drug that's going to alter their behavior. Another category is secular counseling, seeking uh, the counsel of a psychologist or a psychiatrist to try to overcome the issues of life. Now, let's be honest and say that some change is possible through those means. People can modify their external behavior, and sometimes they can even modify certain external, or I should say certain specific patterns of thought. They can change those things, but listen carefully. What those things can never do, what you can never do, is change your heart. You do not have the capacity to change yourself in your essential being. And without that kind of heart change, ultimately all of our efforts to change our thinking and to change our behavior are futile because eventually that sinful nature of ours will express itself in simply another avenue. God puts it like this in Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Clearly, Jeremiah, God, in that text is arguing, no, those things are impossible. Our genes dictate the color of our skin. We can do nothing to change it. The leopard spots are part of his genetic code. Those are locked in. Then he says, well, if, if the Ethiopian can change his skin, the leopard can change his spots, then you also can do good who are in the practice of doing evil. Jeremiah's point is we can't change our nature. And the practical ramification of that is it means we can't consistently make good moral choices because it's contrary to our nature. Our Lord put it like this. He said that a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. A bad tree cannot produce good fruit. But that brings us to the gospel. The gospel is the good news that through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, although you can't change yourself, God can and will change you at the heart level. And that change at the heart level will then change how you think and how you speak and how you act. Now, I think so far most Christians would agree with everything I've said. But I think a number of them would get off the train with the next turn. Because Scripture doesn't just say that for the Christian, heart change is possible. Scripture teaches that for the true believer, heart change is predestined. Listen to Paul in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. He says, those whom God foreknew, those whom God chose for himself, he also predestined. Don't be frightened by that word. Let's take it apart. In English as in Greek, there are these two parts of the word predestined. There's pre, meaning before. Destiny, meaning one's, e one's future. God has predetermined the destiny of those whom he chose. And what was the destiny that he predetermined them to? To become conformed to the image of of His Son. You see, real heart change for the true Christian isn't merely possible, it is predestined. God determined that it will happen, and it will happen. 
So the question is, how? How does God accomplish that change? Well, of course, that brings us to the cross. That brings us to Christ, our Lord. It was at the cross that Christ paid the penalty for our sin that enables us to be forgiven by God, to be declared right before God. So Christ paid the penalty for our sin. But listen carefully then. At the moment of salvation, Christ did something else. He broke the power of our sin so that we are no longer its slaves. The moment you were saved, Christ shattered the enslaving power of sin in your life. Here's how the Apostle John puts it in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. He says, He loves us, speaking of Christ, and He released us from our sins by His blood. Those of you who have any even first-year Greek, you'll recognize the Greek word translated release there. It's the, it's the verb luo that's used in all of the tables to learn the conjugation of the Greek verb. It means to loose. Christ loosed us from our sins through His death. He shattered the power of sin so that we no longer have to be its slaves. However, The abiding presence of sin is still a constant reality for every Christian. You know that. You experience that. I experience that. So how does God intend to deal with that remaining sin in our lives? Well, through the power of Christ, God commands that we continue to put to death the sin that remains in us, that remains in what the New Testament calls our flesh. That is the part of us that remains unredeemed. And the process by which we pursue that real heart change, or we could say by which we pursue holiness, or we could say by which we pursue Christ-likeness, that process is called progressive sanctification. Now what is sanctification? Here's a great definition from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Sanctification is, quote, the work of God's free grace by which His Spirit continuously delivers the justified sinner from the pollution of sin. So here's a person who's already been justified, already saved. The Spirit continuously delivers the justified sinner from the pollution of sin, renews his whole nature in the image of God, and enables him more and more to die to sin and to live unto righteousness. That's sanctification. And by the way, that is not optional. Christ demands sanctification of every Christian. Sadly, however, I think in today's church, this has become a forgotten truth which you and I must always remember. We must pursue holiness. We must pursue holiness. This is the message of the Scripture. Romans chapter 8, verse 13, Paul is contrasting believers and unbelievers, and he says of unbelievers, if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. Here are believers. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. When Paul wants to describe a true believer, he says a true believer is somebody who is putting to death the deeds of the body. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, he says, consider as dead. Literally, the Greek text says, put to death the members of your earthly body. That is, the sinful patterns that are attached to your fallenness. Put them to death. And the writer of Hebrews says it in a way that I hope if you've never heard, you will mark, underline, star. Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue sanctification. The Greek word translated pursue means be continually striving for. Be continually striving for sanctification. And then he adds this, without which no one will see the Lord. Don't for a moment imagine that you can tuck salvation in your pocket as some sort of divine life insurance policy or get out of jail free card. The writer of Hebrews says, no one, no one will see God. 
except the one who has pursued sanctification. In other words, that's what it means to be a true believer. So the unmistakable message of Scripture is that every Christian must pursue, must strive for holiness or sanctification. Now that's Paul's message to us in Ephesians 4 in the text we just read together a moment ago, especially in verses 20 to 24 of Ephesians 4. Paul's point here is that we have already experienced a radical change at the moment of our conversion. Notice verse 20, you learned Christ. It's a beautiful expression for our salvation. You learned Christ. In other words, you entered into a teacher-student relationship with Him. And then he further explains. He says in verse 21, you heard Him. Now, he's talking to the church in Ephesus, most of whom never met Jesus Christ physically on the earth. This is long after the resurrection, long after the ascension. But he says, you heard Christ. What he means is, when you heard the gospel and responded, it was as if Christ were speaking to you through the gospel. That's what he says, remember, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when he says, when we present the gospel, it's as though Christ is making a plea through us. When you heard the gospel, you heard Christ in the gospel, calling you to himself. And then he adds this. Verse 21, you have been taught in Christ. Now we've moved beyond salvation. We're now post-salvation. And he says, you have continued to learn Christ through ongoing instruction in the school of Christ from Christ. And then Paul introduces us to how this change that we all want and desire actually happens in our lives as Christians. Now, let me first lay out for you the structure of the Greek sentence, because I think it's crucial to understand. The verb that he's really playing off of here in in verses 22 to 24 is the verb back in verse 21, you have been taught. And then notice verse 22 begins, that. You have been taught. Now, in the Greek text, the verb you have been taught is followed by three infinitives that summarize the content of what we've been taught. We have been taught that, and then there are these three infinitives. In English, these three Greek infinitives are translated this way. Verse 22, lay aside. Verse 23, be renewed. And verse 24, put on. So this sentence then reads like this. You have been taught through ongoing systematic instruction after your conversion to do three things. To lay aside the old self, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self. Now this immediately raises a question. If you're biblically literate at all, you know that in Romans chapter 6, Colossians 3, Paul says that our old self is dead. If that's true then why do I still need to put it off? And in regeneration, if my new self was created, why do I still need to put it on? This can be confusing for many people. I think it becomes clear, and we unlock Paul's meaning here, if you notice that he's using mixed metaphors. He used two different word pictures in this text for two different things. Notice the first word picture in verses 22 to 24 is there's this, there's this radical change that has happened in our person at the moment of salvation. And he pictures that as the old self and the new self. He's looking back to the moment of salvation. He's saying before, before that moment was our old self, and after that moment was our new self. But in addition to that picture of this past radical change that has happened in our essential self, Paul also uses another picture. It's a picture of clothing. Notice verse 22, lay aside. Verse 24, put on. So you have these two pictures. Old self, new self. Old clothes, new clothes. Two different pictures. What's Paul doing here? Well, He's saying when we came to Christ, our old self died and was buried. 
We were made a new person in Jesus Christ. That's regeneration. And that hope happened the very moment you believed in Jesus Christ. Technically, it happened the moment before you believed. At the same moment, but logically, just before you believed. That's regeneration. And because of that past reality, Paul says, we have been taught to lay aside the clothes that belong to our old, dead, former, before Christ self. And we are to put on the clothes that match our new self. And so what are these clothes in this text describing? Well, clearly in the context, as we'll see, the clothes here are describing the old clothes are describing the old habits of thinking and behaving. So because you are a new person, Paul says, take off the clothes, those old ratty clothes that belong to the person you were. Take off those old habits of thinking and behaving and put on the new clothes that fit the new person you are. There's, a, I think, an analogy that we can use it's not the, the intention of the text, I'm not saying that, but I think it's, a, it's an analogy we can use from the raising of Lazarus. You remember in John 11, where Christ raises Lazarus from the dead, and we read in that text, verse 44, the man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth, and Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. In Lazarus' case, he had been raised from physical death but he was still dressed in those old grave clothes. In our case, you and I have been raised from spiritual death, but we still wear the clothes that belong to the person we used to be before Christ, the habits of thinking and behaving that perfectly fit our old self. And we must lay those clothes aside and put on habits of thinking and behaving that are in keeping with our new life in Jesus Christ. That's the point of these verses. So what I want you to see is that in these verses, Paul provides us with a series of practical commands of what you and I must do in the process of sanctification. How we are to pursue holiness. Let me ask you this morning, do you want to change do you really want to change at the heart level? If you're in Christ, I can promise you this, you do. You do. You want to be like Christ. You don't want to be like the person that you were, or even to some extent like the person that you are. How do you do that? Well, Paul here lays out for us in this text three basic steps for real, lasting heart change. Let's look at them together. Number one, lay aside the old self. Verse 22, Paul says, you have been taught or instructed that in reference to your former manner of life, that is, when it comes to the patterns and the habits of your old life, the person you were before Christ, that you lay aside the old self. The word translated lay aside was often used of simply taking off and laying aside a piece of clothing. I could show you, but I think that's unnecessary. It's often used that way. And eventually, this word became a metaphor for putting off an attitude or behavior. Notice what Paul tells us here. He says, I want you to lay aside or put off the old self, the person you used to be. Not just particular sins alone, but everything connected to your old self, to the, to the life you used to live that was dominated by sin. Do you see Paul's point? He says, listen, your old self is dead, so take off those ratty clothes he wore. Lay aside all that remains of the old life, its way of thinking, its desires, its self-will, its sinful habits of thinking and acting. Notice how Paul describes the man or the person we used to be. Verse 22, it's being corrupted in accordance with lusts of deceit. Paul says, the person I was is not only dead, he's decaying. And he's decaying because of those deceitful lusts. That is, those cravings that deceive us. 
Boy, is that true. And Paul says, if you want to grow spiritually, you must take off all your old habits of thinking and behaving and lay them aside. You have to stop doing them. That's what he means. Put them off. Stop them. But let me tell you something. If that's all you do, they'll be back. You know that personally and experientially just like I do. How many times have you tried to stop something? And that's all you've tried to do, and over time, it's back. Because this is only one of the three steps to real change. Yes, we must stop. We must lay aside the deeds that belong to the old self. But there's a second step as well. Notice verse 23, we must be renewed in the spirit of our minds. You must be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 23, and you have been taught, secondly, Paul says, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Literally, you have been taught to go on being renewed. This is a constant process of renewal. Now, there's a really interesting way Paul changes his wording that's very important. Notice, lay aside and put on are our actions. They're things we actively do. But be renewed is passive. It's what theologians call a divine passive. This is what God does to us. God renews us through His Spirit. So Paul says, be renewed. Don't renew yourself. But at the same time, notice it's a command addressed to us. Be renewed. Now, how can that be? Well, the implication is that while only God can renew our minds, you and I can either hinder that renewal or we can promote that renewal. And so he tells us, be being renewed. Promote that process. Don't fight that process. Paul is saying facilitate the process of renewal that the Spirit wants to perform. And specifically, what is this renewal the Spirit wants to do? Verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The word spirit here is lowercase s. This is not the Holy Spirit, although the Holy Spirit is performing this. He's talking about a renewal of the, we could say, the disposition of our mind. Or maybe a better way to say it is this. Be renewed in the grid through which you see and interpret everything. your way of thinking. So this renewal then totally transforms our thinking. Isn't this exactly what Paul said in Romans 12 too? He says, don't be conformed to this age. Don't allow the mindset of the age in which you live to force you into its way of thinking. Don't be shaped by its mold, is literally the word picture he uses. But rather, be transformed. The Greek word is the word from which we get our word metamorphosis. If I could put it this way, be metamorphosized by the renewing of your mind. Now, when Paul says we're to be renewed in our thinking, renewed in what way? Renewed to what? Well, I think you're aware that Paul wrote several of his letters from the same prison cell at around the same time. And there are parallel references in those letters that help us understand what he writes in others. In this case, there's a parallel passage written at the same time from the same cell to the Colossian church. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, we gain further insight. Listen to what Paul writes. The new self is being renewed, here it is, according to the image of the one who created him. Wow. We are being renewed in our thinking according to the image of God. You see what Paul is saying? He is saying that real change, this is so important to understand, real change only happens when we begin to think and to act like God does. When we begin to think and to act like Jesus does. That's real change. We're renewed in the image of God. 
our thinking is renewed after God's image. You see, Paul is not merely calling for an outward change in our actions and habits. Paul isn't asking you to sort of dust up your life a little bit. Instead, he's calling for real change in the heart that only God can produce. And if that change in the heart happens, then our outward actions will follow. Charles Hodge, writing on sanctification, says, In its essential essence, it is not holy acts, but such a change in the state of the soul that sinful acts become more infrequent and holy acts more and more habitual and controlling. That's sanctification. Do you understand why you, why you and I, why we can't do this? Because we can't change our souls. And yet that's what sanctification really is. We can't produce this kind of change in ourselves. It is the work of the triune God in us. Specifically, Scripture says, it is the work of the Spirit of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, Paul writes that we are being transformed by the Lord, the Spirit. It's something only God can do. Now that invites another question, though. How does the Spirit do it? There's this radical change, real change to our heart where we begin to act and think like God thinks, like Christ thinks. How does the Spirit make that happen? And this is really important. Through the use of the means that God has appointed to this end. You see, there are a lot of Christians who want to change but they think the way change happens is just sitting in a service like this and listening to a sermon and then closing your Bible and walking out. A lot of people think it happens by like osmosis. Go to sleep and zap. God sort of changes you at night while you sleep. No, that's absolutely wrong. But then people blame God for that. It's like, well, I'm not changing. God, where are you? I'm waiting. Listen, don't blame God if you're not changing, Christian. Blame your own laziness. Because God uses means. In his classic book, Holiness, J.C. Ryle writes this, Many admire growth and grace in others and wish that they themselves were like them. You ever seen somebody else and said, Man, I, was, I wish I were like he is. I wish, I wish I was like she is. I wish I could respond to life's troubles that way. I wish I loved my spouse that way. I wish I, whatever it is, you fill in the blank. A lot of people do. Ryle goes on, but they seem to suppose that those who grow are what they are by some special gift or grant from God, and that as this gift is not bestowed on them, they must be content to sit still. Okay, God, I'm waiting. He says, growth in grace is bound up in the use of means within the reach of all believers, and as a general rule, growing souls are what they are because they use these means. Now, what are the means? If means are the way the Spirit changes us, renews our thinking, what are the means that we ought to use? Well, theologians have identified six or seven of them. I could give them to you. But really, there is general agreement, and I would absolutely agree that the other five are only effective if we are using the two most basic and primary means. And those two primary means of sanctification are revealed in one little verse. Go back to John 17. John 17 is the high priestly prayer of our Lord on the night before His crucifixion. And notice what he prays in verse 17. John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Now, do you see the two primary means of sanctification in that verse? The first one is prayer. Prayer. This is a prayer. Jesus was praying for our sanctification. And it is perfectly appropriate for us to pray for our sanctification as well. In fact, we're commanded to do so. In the last petition of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, Jesus says, pray like this, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's a prayer for sanctification. Pray that God would make you more like Christ. Christ. 
Paul prayed that for the churches he ministered to in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. He says, May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. That was his, his prayer wish for the Thessalonians. This is what he prayed for them. So pray for sanctification. Now, a lot of people do that. Maybe you have prayed for your sanctification, prayed to be delivered from a particular sin, and somehow you feel like God's let you down. Listen, God has not let you down because that isn't the only means of sanctification. There's a second one in this verse. Look at verse 17. It's the truth. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Now, that little preposition in is translated in other places as through or by means of, and I think that's the idea here. Jesus asked the Father to make those who are already His progressively more holy by means of the truth. And the rest of verse 17, Jesus defines the truth. Your word is truth. So the truth that God uses to sanctify is the entirety of the Scripture. The renewed mind is one that is saturated by the Word of God. Remember, we're to be renewed in our thinking so that we think like Christ. So how do you learn to think like Christ? Well, in 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says, in this book you hold in your hand, we have the mind of Christ. This is his mind. This is how he thinks about everything that's important. You have the mind of Christ right here between the covers of this book and being saturated with what this book says will change you. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you. The Holy Spirit renews our mind through the Scripture. Now what is our part? Why does He say to us, be renewed? Because our contribution to this is consistent exposure to the Word of God. Read the Bible. Study the Bible. Meditate on the Bible. Listen to the Bible taught. Pray all you want for sanctification. That is one of the means of of the Spirit to sanctify us. But don't you dare stop there and blame God that you're not growing. Because the other means, the primary means that the Spirit uses is the Word of God. And you are responsible to be in the Word of God. I can't tell, tell you how often I talk to people who are just pulling out their hair about some sin struggle in their life, and I find out that they're neglecting the Scripture. Listen, don't blame God. Blame your own laziness. This is the primary means the Spirit uses, and He's not going to change for you. Also understand that the renewing of our minds is the main hinge on which true sanctification swings. Without this work of the Spirit, our putting off and our putting on is merely changing our behavior. It's no different than self-reformation or behavior modification that unbelievers practice all the time. That's why Christ prays, sanctify them through the truth. It's only as the truth changes our thinking that real change happens. Now, there's one more step in the process of real change. Not only must we lay aside our old habits of thinking and acting and allow the Spirit to renew our minds, but thirdly, we must put on the new self, verse 24. Specifically, again, back in Ephesians 4, he says, and put on the new self. The word for put on is the counterpart to lay aside. It simply means to put on clothes. Paul means that we are to think and act in keeping with our new selves. As we put off old thinking and old behaviors and allow the Spirit to renew the way we think with the Scripture, we need to do something. We need to begin to practice what we learn. We need to begin to practice new patterns of thinking and acting. We simply need to struggle to obey what we learn patterns that reflect the new person we've become. What's our new person like? Notice verse 24, the new self, which is in the likeness of God. Our new life in Christ is patterned after God himself. Look down at chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God 
as beloved children. We are to think and act like our Father does. And we are to think and act like Christ does. Look at verse 2 of chapter 5. And walk in love just as Christ also loved you. In other words, imitate Christ. Imitate the Father, imitate Christ. Because this new self you have is created in the likeness of God. Notice he goes on to say in verse 24, our new self has been created in righteousness and holiness. Righteousness means we treat other people by God's standard. Wouldn't that make for a totally different world? And holiness, that has to do with our, with our relationship to God, probably in this context implying fear and reverence for God. Put on. So here's the question. How exactly do we put on the clothes that belong to the new person we have become? It's very simple. Listen carefully. By applying the truth you learn to yourself and seeking to obey it. By applying the truth to yourself and seeking to obey it. That's all it means to put on. Lloyd-Jones puts it this way. He says, the whole matter of putting on the new man is in essence the application of truth to ourselves. It is the most important thing that one can ever discover in the Christian life. We must talk to ourselves, we must preach to ourselves, and we must take truth and apply it to ourselves and keep on doing so. Now, verses 22 to 24 then provide us with a summary of the process of true change. We must lay aside, be renewed, and put on. Beginning in verse 25 and running down through verse 32, Paul gives us several illustrations of what this looks like in real life. Just look at the first one there in verse 25. Therefore, in light of what I've just taught you, now watch for those three components. Laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Notice, first of all, lay aside. Put off lying and deception. Stop it. And be renewed. In this case, the only information he gives us to renew us is to say, you're members of one another. Lying to other believers or to other people is like one member of your physical body lying to another member of your physical body. It's ridiculous. It makes no sense. And then he says, put on. And what is the lying person to put on? Verse 25, he's to put on speaking truth. Now, that is so important, because listen carefully. A liar only stops being a liar when he becomes known for telling the truth. You know, liars don't lie every moment. They don't tell a lie every second. So how does a, a liar really change? Not just by stopping his lying for a few minutes, but rather by becoming known as a person who tells the truth. This is the principle of replacement, and it's absolutely key. The only way to put off the thinking and practices of your old self is to get into the Word of God, let the Holy Spirit renew your thinking, and help you identify the virtues that you ought to put on in place of that old sin. Replacement. Listen very carefully. Every sin in your life has a corresponding virtue that you should put on. Every sin in your life has a corresponding biblical virtue that you should put on. And if you want to put off the sin, then you must identify that virtue and strive to put it on. Look at verse 28. Paul gives us another example using stealing. He says, I want you to lay aside stealing. He who steals must steal no longer. Stop stealing. But then he says you need to be renewed. Now, we could go other places in Scripture and, and learn about God as the owner of all property. Everything belongs to God, the earth and everything in it. God sovereignly distributes property according to His choice. God then gives me a stewardship, and He expects me to care for what He gives me, and He expects me to make sure that I don't harm that that He's given to others. He tells me that the resources He's given me are to be used for the care of my family, to, to expand the kingdom of Christ to save for the future. And notice he says here in verse 28 that we are to use our resources to help others in need. 
But again, so far, he's still a thief because a thief doesn't steal every moment. So a thief who isn't stealing at this moment is still a thief. So how does a thief become something other than a thief? Well, he needs to put on. What does he need to put on? Look at the verse. It says, verse 28, rather, here's what he needs to put on instead of stealing. He must work, get a job, and perform with his own hands what is good, not only for himself, but so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. A thief stops being a thief when instead of taking from others, he works hard so that he can give to others. You see the replacement? Put off and put on. Now maybe your sin struggles aren't in the couple we've looked at. Maybe your primary sin struggle isn't lying or isn't stealing. It doesn't matter. You see, whatever your sins are, the process works exactly the same. Let me just remind you what we've learned from this passage, the practical process you ought to follow. Here it is. Number one, identify the sins you need to put off. Make a list. Mental or write it out. What are the sins? And oh, by the way, use biblical language. Don't cater to your flesh. Don't say, well, you know, sometimes things happen and I just get frustrated. Use your concordance all you want, and you won't find that word. What does the Bible call that? Anger. I got angry. Don't say, well, you know, sometimes when I'm under pressure and stress, I, I just sort of shade the truth a little. You lied. You were deceptive. Use biblical language. Also, make sure you identify the sin in the heart that drives the external act. In other words, don't just deal with the obvious external fruit. It's like, you know, bad fruit growing on a bad tree and you just keep lopping off the fruit. Guess what's going to happen? It just keeps growing back bad fruit. No, you've got to deal with it below the surface. Take the sin of lying, for example. Why do people lie? Jesus said it's out of the abundance of the heart that all these sins come. So what's the sin of the heart behind lying? Well, there are a number of them. Let me just give you two. In the case of Abraham lying about Sarah being his wife, why did he lie? Out of fear. In the case of Acts 5, Ananias lies about how much money he got from the sale of the property as he gave it to the apostles. Why did he lie? Greed or pride? He wanted to look good? Yeah. So for the act of lying then, if you're trying to cut that out of your life, there are two sins to be put off. Not only the sin of lying, but the sin in the heart that lies as the motivation for that lie. So identify the sins you need to put off. Make a list of them. Number two, identify the opposite biblical virtue. Again, for every sin in your life, there is an opposite biblical virtue. What is that virtue? What is it for lying? What's the opposite of lying? Truth-telling. What's the opposite of stealing? Giving. Generosity. What's the opposite of lust? Craving what you don't have. Gratitude. Being grateful for all of the many good gifts God has given. So, in every case, whatever your sin is, there is an opposite virtue to be put on. Your job is to find out what that is. Number three, this is where the renewal takes place. Study what Scripture says both about the sin and the corresponding virtue. And let me add this. This isn't on the slide, but let me just say this. Focus on how your Father and how your Lord don't manifest your sin in Scripture and focus on how they do manifest the virtue that you ought to put on. In other words, look at God. Don't just look in the Scripture for principles. Look at God in the Scripture, and seeing God, let that vision change who you are. Meditate on what you learn. It's in this process the Spirit changes the spirit of your mind or how you think. wish I had a lot more time, but turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I want you to see a key verse on the issue of sanctification. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. If you've never seen it before, star it, memorize it. It's, it's foundational. 
2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul says, but we all, meaning all Christians, including those troubled Corinthians, we all, every believer, with unveiled face, in the context here, he's just said that when we turn to Jesus, the veil that's over the Scripture and our understanding of the Scripture is removed. We see the Scripture. We get it. But we all, with unveiled face, now watch this next expression, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. That used to trouble me because what do you normally see when you look in a mirror? Yourself. Now, Scripture is sometimes described as a mirror in that way. For example, in James 1, we look into the mirror of Scripture and we see ourselves. That's not how it's used here. In context... Paul has just been talking about Moses seeing God on Mount Sinai. And how did Moses see God on Mount Sinai? How? Face to face. He saw him face to face. You and I don't yet get to see God face to face. So how do we see God? Look at verse 18. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We don't see God face to face. We see His reflection on the pages of Scripture. We're not looking at our reflection in the mirror. We're looking at God's reflection in the mirror. And as we look at God's reflection, His character, as we see the glory of the Lord in His Word, notice what happens, verse 18. We are being, here's our word, metamorphosized. We're being radically changed at the heart level into the same image. As we look at our God, we see what He doesn't do. We see what He does. The Spirit changes us. Notice, by the way, it's not, it's not change that we initiate. It's from the Lord, the Spirit. And it's change that happens, notice, from one level of glory to another. From glory to glory, we just keep growing. But it happens when we look at God's reflection in His Word. And as we do that, as we stare at God, we're changed into the same image. Back to our little list. Number four, do your homework. I don't mean your schoolwork. I mean your homework. By this I mean not only do you study the Scripture, but when you look at your sin, you study yourself. You study yourself. Keep a journal for two or three weeks de detailing when and how you sin. Paul David Tripp, in his excellent book, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands, encourages us as we look at each struggle we have with sin to answer five questions about each incident. Answer these questions. What happened? What did you feel? What were you thinking? What did you want? And what did you do? And as you analyze those things in each case, look for unbiblical goals that you have, unbiblical thinking, unbiblical emotions, unbiblical acting. In other words, you're not only studying the Scripture, you're studying yourself. Number five, then create a plan to put off and put on. Make a plan. This doesn't happen by osmosis. You've got to pursue obedience. You see, in sanctification, you and I must expend maximum effort to obey. And as we expend the effort, God does what we could never do. He changes us at the heart level. In Philippians chapter 2, this is what Paul says in verse 12. He says, I want you to obey even more in my absence and work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The word work out is translated in the, or used in the Septuagint, I should say, of cultivating a field. He says, I want you to cultivate what God has planted in your soul, your sanctification. Why? For, because, here's why I want you to cultivate it, because God is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Do you see that attitude there, the mix, the, the balance? Work as hard as you can to obey the Scripture all the time depending entirely on God alone, knowing that He's the only one who can really change you. 
Lloyd-Jones says what happens in sanctification is that God takes this truth, this word of His, and by the Holy Spirit opens our understanding of it, enables us to comprehend it, so that after we've received the truth and comprehended it, we then proceed to apply it to ourselves. Here's the key. And the whole time, God is enabling us to do that. Do you see, beloved, sanctification isn't something that happens suddenly. It's not an experience to be looked for. It's a marathon, not a sprint. It's like the process of physical growth. You're not going to go to bed one night a spiritual infant and wake up the next day a spiritual father. It doesn't happen without a struggle, without a fight. Your whole Christian life is going to be a battle, but a battle in which you can make progress. It will only be complete when you die or when Christ returns. But until then, listen again to the writer of Hebrews. Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Beloved, hold fast to the truth that we must pursue holiness. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for how eminently practical Your Word is, how it speaks to the issues of our lives. Father, help us to pursue change using the means that You have provided. Thank You for this most helpful section. Lord, help us to expend maximum effort to obey You, to imitate You, to imitate our Lord in our thinking and in our behaving. But Father, may you then do what we could never do. May you change our souls as a result. Father, I pray for those here today who are still enslaved to their sin. Help them to see that. And help them to see that freedom is found only in Jesus Christ. He himself said that if he should make us free, we would be free indeed. Lord, may they run to Christ in repentance and faith today and find that He breaks the power of sin. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.